Hello, Tom Lebecki here with the latest edition of the New Theory Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, uh, Brian Keating, who is, and this is like kind of a big deal, he's a Chancellor Distinguished Professor for Physics at the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences uh, in the Department of Physics at the University of California in San Diego. Obviously, this guy is, is a bowler, he's a gamer public speaker, inventor, a whole bunch of stuff, and was actually nominated for a Nobel Prize. And we're gonna get into that. But first, Brian Keaton, welcome to New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today? That's great to be with you, Tom. Thanks for having me on. It, it, it's our pleasure. So, so you're a cosmologist, correct? Yeah, you can tell, right? My hair and makeup look flawless. <laughs> I said it though, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, cosmology and cosmo and cosmetology, the same prefix. It's not an accident. It's not uh, a mistake. They both mean face or beauty. Yeah, and again, you can tell from my beautiful face uh, that that's uh, never been more appropriate than in my case. But uh, actually, it's about the appearance of nothing less than the entirety of the observable universe. That's what we study. And so we try to make it as beautiful as possible. So now before we get to that, it's not every day you get into it like how, how did you how did you like were you like in the stars growing up like what walk us through how you first got into it yeah i wanted to do it for the money uh like most things i went into it for the money for the um for the you know partners and uh and for the fame uh and i went into it because i loved uh i love the stars i love looking up I had a small telescope growing up uh, out, outside of New York City, just north of uh, New York City, Westchester oh, we're, County. Oh, we're, I'm in Jersey. We're in Westchester. Yeah, I grew up in uh, Chappaqua, New York. Yeah, very uh, nice. Home of the Clintons. Home of the Clintons. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, that's right. That's right. Um, so I uh, grew up there, and I like to say that, you know, it's just a tiny little telescope, not much bigger than the one that's over my right shoulder over here, if you're watching it. Yeah. Uh, that little telescope really unlocked the universe to me because I could see through it the same exact things that Einstein would see or Galileo would see or Isaac Newton, wow. namely craters on the moon or the rings of Saturn or the moons of Jupiter. And these things, when you make a discovery with your own eyes, as opposed to, you know, going to NASA's website and looking at yeah. it, it feels like you did something. It yeah. actually gives you the impression uh, that you accomplished something. So that's why now I sell these Brian Keating brand telescopes for $109.99, $99, nice. $99. No, I don't do that. I should, <laughs> but I don't. Should. Love it. I love it. So, so you had an affinity early, you got into it and, um, so, okay, so I want to, I'm going to kind of get into it. You basically put together how the world began to exist. Can you kind of go through that? Because that, um, that just super intrigues me. Yeah, well, I want to make a distinction between what I do as an experimental physicist yeah. and what colleagues like the late, great Stephen Hawking or Brian Greene or um, Michio Kaku, guys you might have heard about, they are like you, they are theoretical. So they yeah. study new theories, literally, about uh, <laughs> cosmology. They come up with right. ideas on if they're right, this is the way the universe should, will be observed, that we will see yeah. certain phenomena if they're right. But most of the time they're wrong. Yeah. And so my job is to build telescopes and take data that could not prove them right, but actually prove their new theory wrong. So I'm in the business of kind of exterminating theories like cockroaches, and hopefully what's left is only the cream of the crop and the yeah. best of all that is remaining will be the truth or have a kernel of the truth. And of course, yeah. you never know exactly what the quote unquote right answer is because there is no one single right answer in the sense that we're always getting more and more refined and getting things known better and better. And what we're trying to do in cosmology is understand the origin and evolution of the entire universe. So, yeah, no big deal. <laughs> now, <laughs> amongst the water cooler, God knows what that water cooler is like, with you and your colleagues. Uh, Vodka cooler. Yeah, at a conference or, or whatever. What's the ongoing current accepted theory scientifically on the basis of society? Like, what's like the working... Kind of yeah. Way. So in science, we don't usually do things by consensus. We don't say, oh, well, 95% of scientists believe that the universe began with a big bang. Yeah. That happens to be true. But actually, some of the most eminent scientists are those that really take a different tack and look at 
different perspectives on how the universe could have originated. So I'm doing a series of podcasts. So I, I run the Into the Impossible podcast, which you oh, can wow. find on Dr. Brian Keating on YouTube. I hope you all subscribe or on iTunes. Um, Put a link competing with a uh, new theory, uh, but uh, it's good to have, maybe I should call it new experiment, but, but well, anyway, we, uh, we could have, you know, dueling podcasts, but we're trying to unravel what is the essence of a theory of everything, a theory yeah. that, as you're saying, around the water cooler, as we used to gather, um, what is it about a law of physics that would account for all the observations that we can make today? So the properties of the most small things in the universe, the protons, neutrons, Croutons, no, they're not croutons. They're not, but, um, <laughs> I was going to say salad going, you know? <laughs> yeah, I was getting hungry. Uh, and then wanting to know what is the essence of how the smallest things in the universe affect the biggest things in the universe. So check out over there, over my left shoulder, yeah. is the periodic table of the elements. Well, yeah. th there's only about 20 of those elements that are in your body. Yeah. And, you know, most of them are, you know, kind of loser elements, shall we say, uh, <laughs> that kind of go out there. Um, but uh, in fact, the periodic table itself never won a Nobel Prize, yeah. uh, even though it's, it's quite impressive. Now, if you break it down, first, so that means everything that you're made of yeah. is just a different arrangement of, of these primitive objects. And yet Correct. you feel very different than a lump of quartz or, Correct. you know, Correct. some, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a Heisman trophy. I, yeah. I don't know. Uh, but, but on the same token, you can even develop that and reduce that. And it turns out that you and I are basically made of two different kinds of quarks, what are called quarks, these subatomic particles and okay. electrons. And that's it. So there's three things that we're made of. That's it. And so how, how, how do those three simple things, it must be the magic, the, 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 the spirit in the machine must be due to how these things are arranged. And that's what we're trying to unravel. Okay. And once you do that, then you can reverse engineer it in a whole bunch of world of uh, possibilities. And I guessing this is kind of in your wheelhouse because you probably obviously studied evolution because how did we get here? The dinosaurs, what happened there? Like, oh yeah, I'm the like dinosaurs. The world on your shoulders, like you're responsible for everything. I didn't know oh. this was gonna be so cutting edge and timely, Tom. I, I thought we'd be talking about things, you know, that were much farther in the past. So yeah, 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs didn't have much of a space program. There was no yeah. NASA going on back then. And uh, there was a giant lump of this stuff over here. So these are fragments of an asteroid that I keep uh, by my desk at all times to humble myself. Oh, but wow. this, is, this is really a, a fragment of a meteorite. If you and I ever meet in person, I'll give you one of these. Oh, wow. uh, th this is a meteorite that exploded, impacted into Argentina, you know, perhaps thousands of years ago. Oh, wow. And, uh, and a giant version of this, you know, perhaps uh, you know, 100 miles wide or so, impacted in the Mexican Yucatan Peninsula area and created a, a crater that one of my you know, kids has memorized the name of better than I can, but I think it's pronounced Chicxulub. And Chicxulub is an undersea crater. You can't see it from the air, so to speak, or from satellite images. You can only see it with certain kinds of radar and soundings and everything, but it's obviously a huge crater and uh, the impact, uh, resulting impact produced a cloud of microscopic versions like dust and particulate matter that then blanketed out the entire planet and cut off the sunlight. And that sunlight being cut off killed off a lot of plant life. And many of the big dinosaurs that relied on the plant life died off because they couldn't have anything to eat. And then other that dinosaurs could that, eat, could eat yeah, that couldn't eat them. And then, you know, it's like <laughs> ad infinitum. So that's what happened there. And like with the dinosaurs, the, uh, a little, you know, equally catastrophic event happened to me, thanks to this uh, substance called dust, cosmic dust. And that's that it caused me to lose my own, you know, version of this, the Nobel prize getting uh, cracked. Yeah, that's me. what, okay. So that's the story of my book. I don't want to minimize, but you did a whole bunch of dope stuff and put some great work together that got recognized enough to be up for the Nobel Prize. So Potentially, before, yeah, yeah. It's not, it won't be clear you know, who was nominated. We, we eventually had to retract the claim that I was a part of. And so you know, some say we don't know who was actually nominated, but I nominated the winners of the Nobel Prize or you know, potential winners of the Nobel Prize, uh, very select cohort of people that nominate winners of the Nobel Prize. Yeah. And so I saw how the sausage was made. Uh, you know, I was in the room, so to speak, how, where it happened. Uh, this is four, uh, four years ago now. And it really revealed to me how kind of, uh, corrupted the process has become and, and humanity's most superlative award. Wow. So, okay. And 
but a, a, a good a, a certain portion of your work was recognized and you had a theory and there was a whole bunch of people kind of trying to either debunk it or I, I well, I'm just trying to do as much research as I can to be dangerous but what was that body of work that at least got the recognition of folks at that level? Yeah, so we built a telescope that was located at the uh, bottom of the world in a place called the uh, Amundsen Scott South Pole Research Center. I love that story, by the way. I, yeah. I use that as my business allegory every day. It's like almost <laughs> like beat it like a rented mule that uses something. <laughs> so we built a telescope that doesn't see uh, light like your eyes or the small telescope behind my shoulder over here. Yeah. That guy over there. Uh, instead, it saw heat and the heat was left over from the Big Bang. And that heat we were hoping would reveal not only the, uh, the, the kind of history of the universe, but how it started. In other words, what were the initial conditions when the universe came into existence? either from a single big bang, either from a previous universe that used to exist um, uh, uh, and many other different uh, conjectured possibilities. We wanted to know how that happened and the uh, most uh, efficient way to look for it was via this ancient heat left over from the big bang called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Yeah, I was reading about that. And, and what, what did you prove, disprove, or at least shed some light on in your research? Ah, good pun. Uh, yeah, the light that we shed on was really the heat that was left over. We discovered that the universe was suffused with a type of, of um, pattern, that there's a type of distribution of light or microwaves rather, like radio waves, um, not unlike what you have in your kitchen. You know, most people have a very high powered microwave generator in their kitchen, but they don't have like a high pay powered x-ray machine or something in their kitchen. If, if you most do, of us don't, you know. Yeah, some authorities will come uh, check you out if you do. Uh, but, uh, and we built this telescope that was sensitive to this pattern of light expected to be present from theory, from based on uh, new theories invented in the 1980s, that the, that the universe would have a type of handedness, would have a type of pattern, a swirling pattern that we could detect uh, if we looked hard enough with enough advanced technology and enough in, uh, uh, processing power in our analysis, our computing, et cetera. And so we did discover this pattern, you know, which is amazing that we could discover how the universe came into existence, uh, you know, not 65 million years ago, we're talking 13.8 billion years ago. Oh, wow. And that became kind of, uh, you know, obsession for many, many, you know, people around the world, because it would be like discovering what ignited the Big Bang. Correct, and correct. that, that would be a phenomenal discovery, not only for our intellectual curiosity, but yeah. also, as I hope, to win one of these, yeah. uh, another one. This is mine. You can't have this one. This one. <laughs> uh, so we knew that that would come along with it because it was such a monumental discovery. And we made the announcement on St. Patrick's Day 2014 that we had discovered the, how the universe effectively originated via this pattern of microwaves that we had detected from our observatory at the South Pole. And the observatory is called BICEP. It's, it's on the picture, the cover of the book here. Yeah. Uh, it's this observatory over here. It's a telescope that looks up and investigates what is the nature of this very special light coming from, we thought, from the Big Bang. Interesting. And, and out of that research, and then you obviously dug the book, Losing the Nobel yeah. Prize. Spoiler, spoiler alert. What, um, what, um, what is some of your, you know, obviously you're a super brilliant guy, right? Well, you're, you're, I still need to like sing the alphabet song to know it comes after you R. But, but you're also human, you know? So, so you had a, I think a, a somewhat of a setback, if you will. Yeah. Um, how did you handle it? How did you overcome it? And, and by being like, like, you know how like facts don't have feelings, right? So like, but when you're a data driven guy, but things don't make sense and you can't re reconcile it, that kind of drives you nuts, I would assume. So you walk us through that evolution. Yeah, well, you know, we are human, and despite the stereotype, you know, that scientists are just these walking Wikipedias or whatever. Uh, so we have emotions, and we have desires, and we have passions, and we have biases and prejudices. And I think a lot of that was manifest not only in what we did, but, you know, in science throughout history, including the greatest scientists like Einstein, Newton, Galileo, and, and many others. Yeah. Uh, and that was to understand what our human frailties, how they can contribute to this kind of false narrative that we that we promoted that we had discovered 
you know, with definitive evidence, the origin of the universe. And because we were so confident about that, we had a big press conference. It, it was on the front page of the New York Times. It was on CNN. It was worldwide, literally. And that garnered a lot of attention. And scientists are not immune from wanting to get attention. You know, Stanford University, one of my collaborators there, home institutions, yeah. they produced this, you know, two minute long video that got 3 million views, um, you know, as soon as it came out with a wow. scientist colleague of mine and a theoretical colleague of mine and and they're all you know kind of overcome with emotion and they have champagne etc uh, and so it just shows that sometimes when you have uh, data and it's in conflict with your desire as I say we're human beings oftentimes evidence will lose out to emotion and you have to guard against that Richard Feynman said famous Nobel Prize winner you know the first principle is not to fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool and so uh, I wonder what his second principle is, but someday I'll find that out. Wow. So, so kind of like a little bit of a life lesson in there along with, um, with, you know, some hard data. So, so, okay. So then like, what did, so what did you do after that? Like, did you like, just get, get it on, get on? Did you pivot in terms of area of research? You know, you know, cause I'm fascinated about a guy at your level, like, like, do you pivot? And if so, what did you pivot to? I just want to get a, get a, my arms around that. I'm yeah, I pivoted to uh, to something called uh, Jack Daniels uh, for about, <laughs> about about a week. It, uh, <laughs> it took about a week. Uh, I took a, a week long bender, uh, and then uh, it came out of it. It was depressing. It was humiliating. Yeah. It was frustrating. You know, I'd kind of warned against it, but then I went along with it. Yeah. I'd been excluded from it. I had you know wanted desperately to win this Nobel prize. And then yeah. I was cut out of the credit. I was, uh, it was more the human drama of it. I, I felt the, the, the pressure that, you know, once you get fooled, you, you shouldn't get fooled again, as George yeah. W. Bush used to say, yeah. uh, and, and wanting to understand how, uh, how it was possible for these great, brilliant scientists at Harvard, Caltech, yeah. Stanford, UC San Diego, and, and many other places, how we could have missed something, which we all knew about, but we still went ahead with anyway and didn't valve it down enough to perhaps avoid the embarrassment, at least that I felt personally. So I resolved, you know what I, I found? Do you know what the most uh, common two words are before somebody says uh, it was the best thing that ever happened to me? I'm going to, I'm going to put my pot. I'm going to, I'm going to become the host for a second here, Tom. Yeah, go Take it over. It's the old experiment podcast with Brian Keating and our guest, Tom Levecchia. <laughs> What are you most likely to hear? I did a Google search on this. So you go through it, you say, um, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Do you know what two words precede those words? I, I don't. I failed. And, I failed. Uh, and, or I lost or I blew it. And I realized, you know, like take the, um, uh, take the Astros or somebody like that, right? So they won the World Series a couple of years ago. And they're one of the best teams in baseball. They yep. came pretty close to getting into the World Series this year. They lost out yep. um, eventually. Um, now imagine that you know the day they win the they win the World Series, and they say, well, next year the Dodgers are going to win it. Yep. Um, would they feel like they're failures? Well, no, because right. most people are not going to win the World Series. So most people are going to lose the World Series. Most people are going to lose law review. Most people are going right. to lose their Nobel Prize and right. lose uh, uh, you know almost anything else. So yep. I feel like. For me, the, the most important thing was, was that uh, I could bounce back with lessons learned and realizing that you're gonna spend most of your time in the headwinds, in the, in the frustration, in the lack of progress. So that's kind of uh, an incentive to enjoy the ride, enjoy the failures along the way. Every failure gets you closer to success. Now, I um, have the, the, the pleasure, including yourself, of, of interviewing some pretty successful people, some great minds. But what I find is, and also my own life is, and it was just funny, I almost wanted to start its own podcast uh, on it, uh, like a blind spot. Like I just myself, like you ever like, like you ever have a friend who calls you up for advice, whether a business question, science or personal, and like they're oblivious to it, but it's so like obvious to you and, but, and vice versa. So like, I kind of feel like a lot of successful people because they're being human, they're fallible, have a blind spot, right? And yeah, a retro analysis, which you probably did a minute of, was there a blind spot, maybe a lack of appreciation for the political part of the process? Was it, oh crap, might should have reversed hypothesis this way, data-driven, not data-driven? 
give me if you had I, i'm gonna guess you had a blind spot in retrospect and if not i'll, I'll trust you but did you have a blind spot that you kind of re realized that you had afterwards and you were like, shit, you know? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't have a okay. blind, I didn't have a blind spot. Yeah. I had, you know, 20 blind spots. <laughs> so, so one of the ones that really became paramount to me was how much I was allowing this little three inch golden medallion yeah. to motivate my, my narrative and yeah. my define my self-worth. And it's common in academia. Don't forget, I don't know, you, you, you went to college, I assume. Yeah, I have a master's degree. Rutgers the, undergrad and then a fairly ridiculous, fairly Dickinson uh, master's. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so, I, uh, so Rutgers is one of our, our main collaborators on the Simons Observatory, which is one of the successor experiments to the nice. BICEP2 experiment. Anyway, uh, yeah, how this Nobel Prize was influencing me and driving me, and it's kind of like ultimate, you know, getting likes or winning the presidency or, I mean, just yeah. notice that, like Donald Trump, love him or hate him, uh, you know, he spent a good portion of this past year advocating that he should win the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. I just had on a guest, Uni Turatini, who is a wonderful uh, writer on my podcast, uh, Into the Impossible podcast on iTunes or Dr. Brian Keating on YouTube. And she was saying, you know, she, we, she and I were talking about her book called Betraying the Nobel about all the evil people that have won the Nobel Peace Prize or been nominated for it, like Adolf Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin. And, uh, and then people like Aung San Suu Kyi, who won it and is a war criminal, according to the uh, United Court of Justice, oh. International Court of Justice. So anyway, so here's Donald Trump, who's already the president at this point, you know, over the summer. Maybe he won't be when you guys are listening to this. Uh, but the point is, the, he wanted this little medallion almost more than any, like, yeah. he was tweeting on it from the toilet in the White House, maybe. But he's spending <laughs> some of his day thinking about this, like, yeah. Who cares? You know, you, you, you've gotten to the highest, most powerful position that only 45 people in history have ever had. Yes. And you command the entire planet's resources at some level. And you're worried about this thing that thousands of people have won. It was yeah. just kind of re revelatory to me. But I thought, ah, oh, maybe that's just Trump, but it's not. It's the physicist, it's the scientist, it's the other people that I work with and work around that as close as they come to religion, it's the religion of the Nobel Prize. Interesting. And that was actually a good segue to my, my next question. And don't laugh at the, this one. But um, doing what you do, you know, I just I'm fascinated by the human body, right? Like you get yeah. like stabbed, like the body knows to maybe rush, you know, certain things to help repair it. And you know, you know, the whole like, just the way everything works in harmony in terms of like, you know, physics and so forth. And you obviously prove stuff physically, um, yeah. and mathematically does religion come into play at all or faith come in at all in any of your findings? Uh, or is it, you're just going to kind of laugh, laugh off that question? No, I, I'm actually a practicing Jew. I, I actually go to synagogue. Yeah. I have uh, uh, studied the original Bible, the Old Testament, yeah. in the uh, language that Jesus spoke, which is Aramaic and Hebrew. Yeah. And so I'm very conversant in it and animates a lot of what I do. In the book, I have quotes that, you know, why is it that the book of Genesis, the book, the first book of the Bible, starts with the Big Bang? Yeah. I mean, this is a book that's mostly about this tiny nomadic sect of Semites right. wandering through Egypt and, uh, and the Middle East, yeah. you know, 3,000 years ago. What, what, why do they need to know about the origin of the universe? Yeah. But then I realized that the origin of universe, everybody's fascinated with their origin stories, right? They all want to know how they came about. Mine is particularly Correct. interesting. The book is a memoir about what it's like to be a young scientist, a young man trying to uncover both my own history, my own roots are kind of complicated, yeah. I had uh, religious experiences as an altar boy in the Catholic church. Oh, wow. I, I'm a practicing Jew. I was born Jewish. Uh, and then I was an atheist. Uh, and so it's kind of a story of what it's like. And then to confront, yeah, the fact that 90% of scientists are atheists or don't believe in God. Yeah. And uh, the 10% that do are sometimes mocked, et cetera. But I always point out that there's no greater proof that we haven't changed in 3000 years since the second commandment you know, admonished us not to have any other gods or false graven images that many scientists and many funding agencies and department, they worship this tiny little medallion. And you find that throughout, like you were kind of saying, oh, if M uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University, as if that's not Harvard, but like people talk about Harvard as if it's like getting, you know, getting their kid, you know, as a, a sort of like getting into the promised land. Well, guess what? It's not. 
It's really not. It's not, you know, uh, and so people have a lot of false gods and, and, and they, the, the, to the extent that they deny it, especially with things like the Nobel prize, it really just serves to validate the point that I'm trying to make. You have to check your, check your idolatry. True. So in, in your vocation, you're literally wired to look beyond, right? Yes. So as you look beyond, and I'm starting to get more into, like, I'm a big Joe Rogan guy, and I'm, I'm probably following this thread of who he has on the show or going reverse and who he, he didn't have on the show, you know, previous. Mm -hmm. And some of the people that he had, like Alex Jones, um, my one friend is, like, obsessed with was uh, Bob Lazar and a few other folks that are out there um, and from different, different disciplines and, and et cetera. But one of the things that I'm starting to notice more and more on people that I, you know, it's kind of like Joe Rogan su supplies a validity for me. And by having some of these people on, I'm starting to look more into like extraterrestrial life and beings and so forth. So like, where does the data kind of stand on that? And what has been your kind of research and thought? Yeah. So I'm not uh, allowed uh, to talk about the alien autopsies that I took part in. <laughs> With the like, the, like, the, like the 19, like 85 swatch, they're doing, they're cutting her up. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. The, and the, and that the alien had the swatch. That's, that's the, right, that's, that's right. the unusual right. thing, right? right? Um, yeah. So I had on a, on my podcast into yeah. the impossible podcast, I had on a good friend of mine named Sarah Skulls, okay. and she wrote a book. First, she wrote a book about communicating with extraterrestrial intelligences called SETI, okay. uh, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which is an honest to goodness scientific topic that we're looking yeah. for alien civilizations that have technology. So if an uh, alien planet on another solar system in our galaxy is a slime mold or bacteria, and it has, you know, uh, it has no thumbs and it has no, no Instagram, we're not going to know about it, right? So right. we care about extraterrestrial technology. Yeah. So we're looking for that. That's an honest to goodness pursuit. Um, uh, and then she wrote a book about called Where Are They? And that's about actual alien sightings here on Earth. So they're the guys, you know, kind of taken from the... Uh, uh, you know, this guy from Blink-182, Paul <laughs> Allen, uh, yeah. Bigelow, this guy Bigelow, and yeah. other people that are really pursuing this, you know, millions of dollars going through this and, and declassifying documents. Um, I see zero evidence from a scientific perspective that there's any uh, reason to believe that there are actually aliens here um, for many reasons, but one of which is that right now there's, you know, on the other side of the earth from you and me in Europe and Asia and Australia, Africa, there's thousands, maybe 10,000 astronomers either looking through telescopes, using telescopes, looking up. No one has ever seen anything credibly. Um, and, and a lot of it's kind of like uh, proving negatives. Like they'll say, oh, they won't let us into Area 51. That proves that they have. That they have. It can't so prove I, negative. I learned that. It doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> influence me very much. I don't spend most of my time thinking about it. But those of you who are interested, check out my podcast with Sarah Scholes who uh, wrote this wonderful book called, you know, oh, oh sorry, it's called, well, they are already here. So it's a little bit more provocative. Interesting. So, cause we're gonna, we're gonna be wrapping it up and we're gonna put links to all your stuff. Cause even chatting with you for almost 40 minutes, I, I, I don't have enough, I need more. So I'm gonna check out all your stuff. Uh, but what question um, didn't I ask that you wish I had asked you? Oh, I think um, I wish I uh, could talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, kind of the, the world of, of podcasting, the world of creativity, the world of, you know, future, future creative things that I'm working on, including books and, uh, and other collaborations that I'm working on. Maybe we can talk about that. Okay. So, so you have the book, uh, Losing the Nobel Prize, and we'll put a link to your website, to your podcast, and I'll probably throw in... Um, for good measure, the um, the YouTube channel. So, and then what, what direction are you going creatively? Yeah, so right now I've uh, started a partnership with a podcasting legend named James Altucher. And he oh, and wow, I, fantastic. Uh, yeah, we're working really hard. We have a, a business, a couple of business ideas that we're working on uh, in, the, in the publishing space, in the podcast space. I've been on his show four times. Wow. He's been on my show three times. And uh, we just kind of resonate. He and I actually spoke together at TEDx San Diego oh, wow. uh, about, about six years ago. So we've been friends and known each other for a while, but I only kind of recently connected to him through a very weird, you know, stream of events. So this is what I'd love to communicate to your listeners, yeah. perhaps, is like Please. just the just the new medium that we have now. So I got in touch with him through my friend, Jordan Harbinger. 
uh, who's another podcasting legend. Yeah. And Jordan, I got in touch with, with a guy named Connor Beaton, who runs another podcast called Man yeah. Talk. So all these strings of connections and weaving things together Correct. led to me partnering on a new project, which is about um, lessons that you can learn from Nobel Prize winners. So I've had cool. on six Nobel Prize winners. I've got four more coming up. Wow. And so it's kind of going to be like Tim Ferriss's Tools of Titans. I'm calling it Lessons from Laureates. And it's about the lessons that you learn from the greatest minds in, in history, the, uh, but not only about their science. Like, I don't think you'll be super interested in uh, topological phase transitions in matter. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Prove me wrong, Tom. But, uh, <laughs> but, the, but I think you would want to know, what is their commonality? Like, how much time do they spend on this? What do they do when they're not studying physics yeah. or astronomy? And uh, how do they overcome obstacles? And what do they want to leave to posterity, like Alfred Nobel left a will and money and this, this prize, what, do, what is it going to be their Nobel Prize legacy? So I asked them those questions, and James and I are working on a version of that, uh, a book, uh, 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 audio book, a Kindle, uh, and a uh, physical printed book, self-published. So I'm taking his advice to choose yourself and actually publish all these interviews based on my podcast. I love it. So, so before we conclude, I, I kind of a, it's a loaded question, but, but I know you're a smart guy. I can simplify it is because you have a strong idea or hypothesis, right? Cover ourselves a little bit on how this all started. I'm guessing you probably have some insight to how it could all end. Mm. Not to end yeah. on a morbid tone, but can you give us, you know, other than nuclear war, man-made stuff, but okay, yeah. well, that's probably it, but, but give us, you know, your insight on how this could end. Yeah, right now we believe the universe will be uh, expanding, not only expanding, but the rate of expansion will accelerate, get ever faster as time goes on until essentially the universe becomes infinitely diluted with zero energy. Perhaps even the molecules in our body rip apart due to this repulsive gravitational force called dark energy. Um, and that's coming probably in a, about two years, two or three years. Um, so, you know, you don't have to pay your tax. No, no, it's, uh, we're talking about a billion, a, a hundred billion years, maybe a trillion years. So keep shaving, you know, well, not you, yeah. but, but keep paying your taxes, everybody. Yeah. Uh, the world, the universe will end. Eventually the sun will get uh, so large, it will swallow up the earth and everything in it. But that could be billions of years, four or five billion years. Beyond that, the universe itself could come to an end via what's called the heat death, but it's really a cold death in which there's no more energy or entropy to do anything useful with the amount of light, matter, et cetera, that's in the universe. And eventually it could just be filled with black holes that are kind of just sitting there doing nothing for literally eons. Although my friend, Sir Roger Penrose, who just won the Nobel Prize this year, is going to be a guest on my show this week. He, uh, he won the Nobel Prize. He believes that the universe keeps creating itself again and again in cycles of unending time. So you got that to look forward to, but as Woody Allen said, uh, you know, eternity is pretty long, especially near the end. <laughs> I love that. One, one last question, because I, I'm just, I, I wish I had more time, but, but one last question before we wrap up. Um, climate change. So I want to kind of give like, as my understanding is there's like strong, hard science and we're not, and I promise I'm going to get political, but strong, hard science to, you know, say, you know, why is LA 120 degrees and, you know, polar ice caps and that kind of stuff. So there seems some like ancillary science towards climate change. But then like you kind of have like, you know, James Wood, you know, tweet, retweeting or tweeting, you know, well, why does this stop at the Canadian border? You know, like, so I, I want to, you know, so like, that's why like, I, I, I'm totally going to deep dive your content. Yeah. Because facts don't have feelings. I'm just trying to wrap my head around facts. So climate change, I know may not exactly be your wheelhouse, but you're smart. Yeah, I always say, you know, if I give a talk and somebody yeah. inevitably will ask me about climate change, oh. I always say, you know, if you ask me to give a talk about the origin of the universe, and then someone at the end, or if you ask a climatologist rather to talk about global warming, and then at the end, someone asks her, well, what do you think about the different ways the universe could, could have originated? Um, and then she answers you and doesn't say, well, consult a cosmologist. Yeah. That person is probably not worth listening to. So I, usually I say the climate's incredibly complex. I will say the only thing, and I actually had Ben Shapiro on my show. Oh, wow. Uh, I uh, to we that. have a couple episodes uh, that you can find on YouTube and, and wow. elsewhere. And I agree with, with uh, some things that he said and actually amplify it. So he's basically saying like the, the fact that, the, that we're assuming there'll be no breakthroughs, no innovation 
is stifling towards the uh, actual un, un, you know, unraveling of this problem or solution to this problem. So his opinion is, you know, we have to rely on ingenuity and not stifle it. I add to that, we already know green energy works uh, because we have nuclear power, which is incredibly yeah. safe, incredibly powerful. The power yeah. of the atom is always more powerful than the power of a carbon bond. And yeah. so let's use it. Let's do safer nuclear uh, power, including thorium reactors, including fusion reactors. But also let's not overestimate. You know that James Altucher says, you know what the number one problem uh, you know, afflicting Manhattan and Wall Street that almost shut down the stock market multiple times. You know what it was in the 1890s? It was horse crap, piled up, piled and piled up horse crap. Now imagine they had some huge, yeah. we got to solve it. It's going to affect the economy. Uh, and let's like sh automated shovel, you know, it wouldn't have worked. The car did it, right? So there's going to be innovation. And I, I add to what Ben Shapiro says and say, you know, for certain, the last thing you want to do is tell a kid who wants to be a scientist. No, we have no solution except stopping innovation, stopping technology. You know, solar panel is not very innovative. A nuclear reactor that's safe is. And so I want to focus my kids personally and people that care about this issue, which I believe in very strongly, the climate is getting warmer. But the question is, let's not stifle creativity. Let's work towards the solution. And let's use science. Our greatest magical power is the power of science. I love it. I love it. So Brian, although um, I'll put some robust links uh, for those listening to the audio version and don't have the pleasure of seeing your beautiful face, uh, how can we find you? Yeah, so you can find me, uh, Dr. Brian Keating, Dr. Brian Keating on Twitter, on YouTube, where I have a pretty um, uh, wonderful audience on YouTube. I talk mostly about science, but about a third of the time I'll have Ben Shapiro on, Gad Sad, awesome. I'll have on Noam Chomsky. I'm scheduled to have a bunch of new uh, friends, Nobel Prize winners. I'm talking to Seth Godin oh, wow. in about uh, 20 minutes to two and a half an hour. So tune into that. I get some great guests. And, uh, and then my book, Losing the Nobel Prize, you can find that on my blog, uh, briankeating.com and uh, join my mailing list. I give away meteorites. You can get your own meteorite on occasion. I'll give it, do a giveaway and copies of my book, Losing the Nobel Prize. Love Thanks, it. Tom. Yeah, Dr. Kim, this, this has been a truly a pleasure and uh, thank you for being on the New Theory Podcast. Thank you so much. Have an awesome day, Tom. You too, buddy.